My favorite part of having a native plant garden is hearing all the birds. We have trees for them to nest in and a bird bath where they can drink. There are lots of plants for them to eat, plus lots of insects to feed their baby birds. And baby birds eat a lot. Before fledglings leave the nest, they consume thousands of insects. So it's important to have plants like these that attract insects, which feed birds. But not every yard is like this. We're here to explore the importance of conservation in our own backyards, literally covering the myriad of issues with grass lawns, learning about the importance of native plants, and teaching how you can convert your own lawn into a native meadow. It may seem like a futile effort. A lawn is so small and habitat loss is so huge. But in his book, Nature's Best Hope, Doug Tallamy, a famous conservationist, puts it best. Many people believe that if they don't own acres and acres, their yard is simply too small to build a forest, a savanna, or a prairie large enough to support much wildlife. That might be true if your property were an isolated island in the middle of the ocean, but it's not. Your property abuts your neighbor's property, which abuts another property, and so on. It is more accurate to envision your property as one small piece of a giant puzzle, which when assembled has the potential to form a beautiful ecological picture. Hello, my name is Lizzie Holm. Hi, my name is Magnus Krishansky. My name is Claire. I'm Vanessa Gonzalez-Rickner. Hi, I'm Ara. And I'm Matilda Turek. We're members of the Phipps Youth Climate Advocacy Committee, a year-long program where a cohort of young people learn about climate action and create climate action projects. From that main cohort, we formed a group based on a general interest in native plants, and quickly zeroed in on a project we wanted to explore. There are so many grass lawns in my neighborhood. And lawns suck! You have to mow them all the time, and they don't manage water well, and they don't even support your native ecosystems. First, they require constant maintenance. We have to mow my grandmother's lawn every single week. It's just a big issue. And mowing your lawn with a gas-powered motor isn't good for you. Gas-powered motors release pollutants like particulate matter and greenhouse gases. These pollutants are bad for the environment and your health, with possible side effects including respiratory issues and heart disease. Greenhouse gases are also the cause of climate change, the change in the Earth's long-term weather conditions due to the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases create a sort of blanket around the Earth, which stops heat from escaping the atmosphere. As heat accumulates, it creates a slew of issues, like melting polar ice caps and rising ocean levels. So, maintaining a grass lawn is bad for your health, and it puts more greenhouse gases in the air. What can't lawns do? They barely drain stormwater. Grass lawns have a shallow root system and compact soil, so water accumulates or creates runoff rather than sinking into the ground. Lawn runoff can cause flooding. It may be dangerous for surrounding ecosystems if the runoff contains harmful chemicals like pesticides. My name is Ellen Conrad, and I'm a naturalist educator at the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. In Pittsburgh, with climate change, we are going to see more instances of heavy rainfall. And so investing in plants that have those deep root systems to trap the water is just so essential. Lawns, just don't cut it. Even if they don't directly harm animals, lawns don't help them either. Most lawn grasses aren't native, they're invasive or naturalized, and either way, they're not nearly as beneficial as native plants. But what is an invasive plant? Or, for that matter, a native plant? Native plants. Native plants. Eco-region specific species native plants. A native plant originated in the region where it's living, so it's native to that region, and it generally evolved to fit the location's ecosystem. Meet Bob and Allie Malice, Vanessa's neighbors who graciously gave us a tour of their beautiful native plant garden. If goldenrod pops up in the middle of the garden, we just say great. Like, it's a honey crop, the bees are going to make honey from it in the fall. Goldenrod is native to North America. Therefore, they've evolved to live in places like Pittsburgh and provide food and shelter for native pollinators and animals. Every part of the plant is utilized from wintering sparrows and finches eating its seeds to over 100 species of caterpillar eating its leaves and stem. It's going to promote a lot of beneficial bugs. 
Yeah. Yeah, bennies. We call them bennies. <laughs> he calls them bennies. <laughs> invasive species are not only non-native, they're also harmful to the environment. When it comes to invasive species, I feel like it's something that once you see it, you can't unsee it. Welcome to Bird Park. It looks really pretty, but it's actually an invasive species called a periwinkle. It really takes over and so our native species can't really get a foothold in here. That one is honeysuckle with the stripy kind of bark. Oh, garlic mustard. Yep. It makes actually pretty good pesto. Sadly, the beautiful forsythia that you see over there is also not native to this area. My name is Victoria Kershansky. Well, I mean, so we have a lot of like imports, right? Especially mm -hmm. like with global um, transit and the yeah. things that we grow. The English ivy that just like takes over um, trees and suffocates them. Nope, that's English ivy. Not everything is invasive or native, though. As with most things humans try to categorize, a plant's existence is based more on a spectrum than a rigid structure. So there are some plants that are not native, but also don't harm the environment the same way invasives do. We call those plants naturalized. Kentucky bluegrass, from Eurasia, is one of the most common lawn grasses in America. It lives in an odd place between invasive and naturalized, and is categorized differently across the U.S. It's also difficult to pin down what counts as a native plant. At what point in time do we consider a plant to have originated from somewhere? Corn is an interesting example. Indigenous people in the southern Mexico first began domesticating what we now know as corn about 9,000 years ago. Over the next few thousand years, corn was traded and cultivated up to North America. So after being here thousands of years, is corn native to Pennsylvania? What about dandelions, which arrived from Eurasia in the 1600s? What we do know for sure, native plants are much better for native wildlife than invasive or naturalized plants. Native plants support native bugs, feeding and housing them. Milkweed, for example, is the only thing monarch butterfly caterpillars can eat. Therefore, milkweed plants are vital to the continued survival of monarch butterflies. Native bugs, in turn, are vital for the survival of other species, like birds. Doug Tallamy goes more in depth, but the gist is, birds eat a lot. Fledglings, baby birds, generally leave the nest after a week or so. To help them grow big and strong, bird parents feed their babies hundreds of times a day usually a consistent diet of caterpillars. In a week, these fledglings are fed thousands of caterpillars. Therefore, to support a variety of bird species, the couple of acres around a bird's nest must have plants which support thousands of caterpillars and other bugs. But an acre sounds big and scary and vague. Let's visualize it. An acre is about three quarters of a football field and would fit about five average American homes give or take a few. So to support a healthy ecosystem with lots of gorgeous birds, about 10 houses on a block need enough plants between them to support lots of bugs in a bird's diet. With, of course, the added benefit of beautiful plants that attract beautiful bugs like butterflies and fireflies. A meadow, or a native plant garden, is a natural ecosystem supporting many native plants. Native plant gardens are crucial for ecosystem support, as meadows provide habitat for birds, pollinators, and more. Converting your lawn to a native plant garden is an incredible way to aid native plants and animals, use water sustainably, and avoid excessive maintenance. My name is Ed Wren. I co-founded a, a chapter of Wild Ones Native Plants Natural Landscapes in western Pennsylvania. A, a, a grass lawn is, is a biologically sterile place, e even, if it's, even if you don't put a lot of poison in it. A, a native plant is alive, and a, a, a grass lawn could turn brown and then it could turn green. That's kind of all it does. And throughout the seasons, a native plant garden continuously changes. Uh, it's like a lot of little movies going on at one time, depending on, on where one looks. A meadow has shrubs, grasses, and flowers but few to no full trees. Meadows have deep root systems, so they drain water better than lawns, preventing flooding. On the flip side, they're also more drought resistant than lawns. Though it may take some effort up front, a native plant garden requires much, 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 much less maintenance than a grass lawn. A meadow is only to be mowed once every two years, hugely cutting down your exposure of any pollutants from lawnmowers, reducing your carbon emissions, and just reducing the amount of work put into maintaining beautiful gardens. 
Meadows also, of course, support native wildlife, especially pollinators, by promoting the native plants pollinators love and supporting the bugs that birds feed their young. Meadows are worryingly absent from the United States. Lawns, on the other hand, are incredibly prevalent, integrating the American culture since the popularization of suburbs, but dating back even farther for their use of the saddest symbol of Europe. Around 2010, NASA funded a research project estimating how much of America is covered by turf grass. They came up with this graphic. That's a lot of lawn. Sometimes climate issues feel insurmountable. Bad practices are so ingrained in our culture, in law even, it seems like we can never change. But when we work together, we can always make a difference, for climate action and beyond. Lawn to meadow conversion is the perfect place to start. You almost definitely have a grass lawn, know a friend who has a grass lawn, or even frequent a business with a grass lawn, like your university. For our project, we decided to convert my lawn into a native meadow, and you can too! When you convert your lawn into a meadow, you can put as much effort in as you want. We'll be showing you a lot of things you can do, but keep in mind you can skip steps, work imperfectly, take your time, or just toss a bunch of native seeds into your mildly tilled yard and see what happens. With that, let's begin. The first thing you need to do is pick where your meadow will go. There are two strong candidates in my yard. The first was the garden that had fallen into disrepair. It had a few plants I wanted to keep, but mostly I wanted to start planting a new garden there. Second, my old chicken coop, which had become a place for compost and that random gardening junk that didn't fit anywhere. We weren't sure which to use or what to do after we'd picked a space, so we brought in help. Hi, uh, my name is Stephanie Jellison. I work with um, DCNR's Watershed Forestry Program. We do um, lawn to habitat. That can be any, anything from lawn to a meadow or an upland forest. Whenever you're looking at the site, what's overhead, what's underground, what makes sense, uh, we would tell you to call it a native garden. With Stephanie's counsel, we chose to put the meadow in the smaller storage area rather than the already established garden. During our consultation, we also learned a lot about prepping the meadow and picking out our plants. You'll want to do a survey of the plants in your yard first and keep an eye out for any invasive plants. You'll need to be especially careful when disposing of those. There are a lot of ways to get rid of the grass and other unwanted plants in your backyard. My mom lasagna mulched our yard meaning she layered cardboard and dirt to smother the grass and create a new base soil. You can also just smother grass, similarly with a layer of cardboard and soil. Both of those take a while though, so if you're looking to get something clear fast, you can solarize. To solarize, you put a black tarp over whatever you want clear, which kills the grass with heat from the sun. Of course, you can also just weed and till your soil. Which is what I did. While you're clearing your yard, you'll want to decide what plants you're going to grow. You should consider how much sun and shade the plants will be getting, how much rain you usually get, even the pH of your soil. It's also good to pick plants that bloom in different seasons, so you'll always have something for the pollinators to eat, and a beautiful garden with flowers from spring to fall. For my yard, we got a seed mix from Stephanie, featuring but not limited to black-eyed Susans, butterfly milkweed, and hairy beard tongues. We're planting our meadow with seeds, but you can also transplant natives. My family got a lot of our native plants from native plant sales, and of course there are also seed exchanges and community plant events. Speaking of which, at some point in your process, it will likely be beneficial to reach out to neighbors. It's not uncommon for people with native plant gardens to run into issues with neighbors or HOAs. We did get a citation once from the city. city because someone had called in to report like, hey, they're just letting things overgrow. So we were able to take a picture and send it and say, this is intentional, this is what this is. This is goldenrod, it's intentional, it's here for the pollinators. So we were able to kind of label for them and they're like, okay, no, you're good. Your neighbors do not have to be your enemies. You can explain that your garden is intentional and you may even convince some of your neighbors to plant some natives as well. Once you have everything picked out and cleared, it's time to plant. Whether that means digging holes and transplanting, or just tossing your seeds around and tilling a bit. When putting your plants in, it's also nice to include a water feature, such as a small bird bath or fountain, so birds living nearby can have a place to drink. And your local bees, too. Though it might take a few years to fully develop, it's worth it. Pretty soon, you'll have a meadow of your very own. 
bringing joy to your yard, and working to end the climate crisis one plant at a time. Goodies. Brownie bites. Brownie Whoa. bites. Whoa. Well, you can see the heat around the top, you know, heat rises kind of hurt. Reflectors I'm sorry. <laughs> Lizzie, no. Oh, I'm so warm. Then you're, you're <laughs> Welcome to our documentary where this is wildlife. Immediate zoom in on my face where I'm like, catch out. <laughs> it's completely back right. that you've got like a halo. It's a cooler stick shift at some point. What's wrong? Okay, wait. <laughs> like, what, like, how, what length of filming are you guys looking for for your documentary? Yeah, Matilda, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so fun. Nope, nope not, not that loud. Fun, fun new fact I've learned about Premiere is that it plays the audio that I'm saying as it's recording it and then records that playback also. So. Uh, hello, this is Robot Matilda trapped in an echoey cave. Um, here to tell you that you should convert your lawn to a meadow. Woohoo! <laughs>